I'd like to welcome everybody to the first of our speaker series this year. Um, before we begin, I'd also like to um, acknowledge that this is Mohawk, traditional Mohawk territory. Uh, they're the caretakers currently of this land, and it is on Concordia, as everything in Montreal is sitting on unceded Aboriginal territory. Um, with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Mangan from Davidson College for kindly accepting to come on a, a second attempt. <laughs> Her first attempt, she got stranded in Detroit of all places <laughs> due to the snow. Um, and as I was saying to, as I was commenting that, you know, the snowstorms are approaching. They were in Thunder Bay about two weeks ago. <laughs> so, um, Dr. Mangan is an associate professor of history and chair of the Latin American Studies program at Davidson College in Davidson, North Carolina. Her doctorate is in colonial Latin American history from Duke, and her research on 16th century Peru focuses on the interplay of individual and group responses to the structural forces of colonialism. She has a book, Trading Roles, Gender, Ethnicity, and the Urban Economy in Potosi, 1545 to 1700, also with Duke. It's a social history of trade in Spain's biggest silver mining town in the New World, and highlights native Andean and women in the city's economy. She's currently finishing a book on families in the transatlantic context during the 16th century uh, with a tentative title, Transatlantic Obligations, Legal, Legal and Cultural Constructions of Family in Conquest Era, Peru and Spain, um, with Oxford. Um, I'd also like to explain why Dr. Mangan is here speaking in our First People Studies program, um, is her work actually twigs into the importance of Aboriginal individuals in an economy within the globalized context, which is what this program is also supposed to be partly doing. It's not just Canada. And there are many linkages that we will dis you will see today and we'll discuss tomorrow, some of this. Um, her paper tonight, and she's going to talk about, is in her mother's power. She cannot be raised with good breeding, with indigenous family and colonialism in 16th century Peru. So, Thank you. Well, I want to thank uh, Carl very much for inviting me not only once, but twice, <laughs> since things didn't work out last spring. It's a great honor to come and share my work with you here at Concordia. And um, just make a, a comment about the, the focus of my work, which obviously Colonial Peru, a different um, group of indigenous peoples. And last night when I came through customs, I said, well, what's the purpose of your visit? And I said, well, I'm going to Concordia to participate in First Nations seminar and give a talk and he said oh Inuit and I said no <laughs> um, I study colonial Peru so we had a little chat about that in customs and it was uh, it was a nice way to, to enter at midnight last night with a little conversation about my work so I will go into more detail here for all of you and I look forward to your questions about the work um, when I finish the talk in 16th century Lima Peru Spaniard Antonio de Medina made arrangements to take his daughter, Maria, away from her mother because, quote, in her mother's power, she cannot be raised with good breeding, like I, as her father, would want to raise her and marry her off, end quote. He extracted a promise from the girl's mother that she would allow him to raise her, and he assured Maria that she would receive a thousand peso dowry for her eventual marriage. And while a father's legal power over children trumped a mother's in this context under Spanish law, Antonio de Medina did not object to any mother raising his child. He objected to this mother raising his child because of her indigenous ancestry and culture. Maria's mother was Isabel Yanawad. And in the, the example of Yanawad's life, we see how colonial mobility and labor in exchange intersected with the subject of family. Yanawar had been born in the um, city of Cusco, which was the center of the former Inca empire. And she ended up moving to Charcas, which is in this, uh, well, it's not exactly where that yellow rectangle is, but we're in, we're in the right area when we look at that. So she makes a big move from this region of Cusco down to Charcas, where she was working for Antonio de Medina. So Medina was Yanawar's boss, as well as her sexual partner, coerced or consensual, we don't know. He was also the father of her daughter. Medina left Charcas eventually, and he um, 
left her alone, so she began to work for another Spaniard. This is this guy, uh, Miguel Sanchez. And during that time, um, she raised Maria until Maria was eight, and this is when Antonio de Medina showed up again. So her, her time as a worker for Medina had long ended, but her links to him remained because Yanawar was the mother of his child. The contention by Medina that, quote, in her mother's power she cannot be raised with good breeding was widespread among Spaniards in the middle of the 16th century in the Andes. And it's also an attitude that would lead some indigenous peoples to become, quote, Hispanicized Indians, to cite historian Steve Stern. Women have been suspect as pioneers in this regard and in ways directly related to 16th century family networks. Stern argues, quote, for some Indian women, marriage or informal conjugal relations with outsiders had its attractions, end quote. This contention, has in, Stern's contention, has influenced much of what we think about women, family, and colonialism. My work asks how we can learn more about indigenous family and indigenous women's choices in the 16th century to better understand the family and colonial society. Janowar might have been opportunistic with Medina, or she might not have been. We don't know. What we do know is that years after her working relationship ended, the link to him continued because of their child. And so this is an 18th century painting <coughs> representing um, a family, Spanish father, indigenous mother, and um, mestizo child. And uh, I put this up here because it really contrasts with this family unit of Medina, Yanahuar, and the child, Maria. Right? So we have this idealized notion here of what family was and a very different thing coming from the documents. And the work I've been doing on this book, Transatlantic Obligations, is really trying to get in between um, those two perhaps polar images to think about what's happening in family, <clears throat> excuse me, in, um, in the 16th century. And as Carl suggested, this, this talk is part and parcel of a, this larger manuscript. And uh, I'm, I'm looking at different family relationships and specific themes in that book. So I look at themes of obligation, mobility, surrogacy, that bound together families in this era of colonial expansion. And I'm looking at spouses and at lovers and sisters and brothers and mothers um, and fathers and um, fictive kin as well. I analyze a sample of over 500 wills, dowries, and powers of attorney, among other sources. And the emphasis on these sources is deliberate. I'll try to explain why. Um, there is a lot of religious writing and some prescriptive literature in the 16th century that indicates types of families and hopes for behaviors. But I'm trying to track the working of families over time in a newly settled colony where few of the most influential authors or priests had visited. And so instead, I'm trying to study these families through notaries and court cases that reveal spaces of family formation that add to and are distinct from a religious sphere. I contend that we can build on previous Latin American histories about family to address important aspects of its formation in the 1500s. There are two particular contributions that I want to make in the overall work. And the first is to have a more in-depth social history of this early 1530 to 1580 period and add a range of historical actors to a subject for which elites and Spaniards have been much more familiar topics. And the second contribution is more methodological. It's revealed by a deliberate attempt to track family networks and, and definitions and constructions of family through actions by fully integrating family roles and structures into the way we understand colonialism. And by doing that, right, it reveals that the composition and actions of family are both central to and in tension with the colonial project. A lot of the documentation that colonial historians tend to look at can hide family-like relationships or classify them as something other, other than normal, other than functional, other than relevant to the creation of historical processes in 16th century Peru. And I think these narrow definitions miss quite a lot. So part of what I've been trying to do in my research is to uncover um, things that wouldn't obviously be identified to us looking from a vantage point today as a family relationship or even to priests or um, Spanish bureaucrats at the time. By researching uh, Isabel Yanawar and many other indigenous women of her generation with an explicit eye to family structures, 
My work strips away rigid dichotomies such as legitimate, illegitimate, married, out of wedlock, to show the centrality of indigenous women to the colonial family structure with its blended indigenous, Spanish, and sometimes African members. I argue that indigenous family changed and adapted by incorporating both Spanish individuals and aspects of Spanish culture and law that work to its advantage. The case of Medina and Yanawa reminds us that the overarching power of colonial Spanish males was always there as a dominant force. Yet the fuller picture from the archive reveals more complexity. Here I document how indigenous families and individuals suffered, but also how they responded to the challenges that they were presented with. I'm dividing my remarks up into three, um, three sections. And the first, I talk about um, what we can call elite matchmaking that occurs in the beginning of the conquest period. Um, in the second section, I talk more explicitly about removal of indigenous um, children from their mothers, or excuse me, mestizo children from their indigenous mothers. And in the third section, I talk about um, adaptations and survival of um, indigenous family in urban areas. Um, actually, before I go to section one, I'll get a little drink of water. All right. So in many ways, the pattern uh, for Antonio Medina's behavior that I opened the talk with is established well before 1577 when he actually um, enacts this uh, through documents. They're really set in the 1530s. And so here I want to tread some familiar historical ground and talk about two very famous examples from this time period. Francisco Pizarro, Francisca Pizarro and Elinca Garcilaso de la Vega. In 1532, Atahualpa was a contender for the title of Inca when the Spanish captured him in the city of Cajamarca in Peru. Many of you may know that. Um, he orchestrated many actions during his imprisonment, but one of those actions was to give his sister Quispe Sisa to Francisco Pizarro. In the first decade of Spanish presence in Peru, women of the Inca elite served as objects in diplomatic exchange with the Spanish. Inca rulers gave their sisters to Spanish men in order to promote the same types of relationships that had subjected many foreign men to Inca authority during pre-Columbian times. Women were not exclusively passive objects in these exchanges. And in the early 1530s, the Spanish men who gained elite women as gifts were being fitted into indigenous family structures rather than the other way around. Even as they gave the women in marriage, Inca elite males anticipated that those women would continue complex family obligations in Inca society. Though extramarital relationships dominated in this decade, I do want to note that the crown did not oppose the marriage of Spaniards to indigenous peoples. This is an image from a marriage that comes later in the century. But in 1514, so that's 22 years after Columbus reaches Hispaniola, the crown uh, passed a decree that allowed indigenous uh, peoples, predominantly women, to marry uh, Spanish men. The crown hoped to promote these kinds of marriages to cement military alliances with native chieftains, and to quiet church critics who complained about cohabitation. Baptism was a requirement for indigenous women uh, or men to marry, and so there were relatively few marriages that took place during this early period, in part because, um, in, at least in the case of, of Peru, not very many um, indigenous women were baptized quickly. There are other reasons that the marriages don't take place as well, so we can talk about those. Um, but after their initial pairing with Spanish men, Native women typically traveled along different trajectories that were um, usually determined by their class status within Inca society. So they could have very different outcomes um, from their relationships to Spanish men, but a lot of it was determined by where they were coming from. All right, so I just tried to forward on here where I'm turning pages. This is, this is where um, the old fashioned meets the technology. <laughs> um, for Quispe Sisa, her pairing with Pizarro brought motherhood. Her daughter, Francisca Pizarro, so Quispe Sisa is, is paired up with um, Francisco Pizarro. They have a daughter, Francisca. Um, Contarfuacho is the, is the mother, a very powerful um, Caraca chieftain in the Andes, and she is the mother of Quispe Sisa. So Francisca Pizarro was born in the turbulent early years of Spanish presence, and she grew up in a world where her family ties on both sides were very important. 
Her mother, Contarhuacho, is credited with sending troops from her native chieftaincy of Huaylas to support Pizarro and to safeguard her daughter and her young grandchild um, during a siege of Lima that took place in 1535 to 1536. And this is just one conflict that the young Francisco witnessed as her childhood overlapped with rebellion and years of civil war in Peru. She lost relatives on her mother's side in the ongoing violence between Spaniards and Andeans, and both her father and her brother were killed as a result of the civil wars. When she was two years old, Francisco Pizarro, excuse me, Francisco had taken the requisite steps to, um, to legitimize his daughter, Francisca Pizarro. Um, and this was, he was obtaining a royal decree to have this uh, legitimation happen. This was an uncommon step in this era. Um, and we can sort of look at this and think, well, of course, he was the conquistador of Peru, and he was very powerful, and he wanted to make sure she was legitimate. Um, but if you look at the number of times this is happening versus the number of relationships like this during this period, it, it's rather uncommon to have this kind of legitimation. Um, he also took various other kinds of steps to care for her, and one of those was you might be guessing already, the removal from her mother to be raised uh, with paternal relatives. So she was being raised in the house of Spaniards in Lima. Her mother, Quispe Sisa, was still alive. Um, she was baptized and was then known by another name, Doña Ginés Huelas uh, Yupanqui. But she did, not raise, uh, she did not raise Francisca. By the end of the decade, um, King Charles I had decided that he didn't want any of Pizarro's mestizo children to remain in Peru. He had serious concerns about their potential power when they would come of age as adults, and they were powerful on both sides, both the ties that they had to indigenous peoples as well as to um, Pizarro's political allies. So um, they were they were not asked to leave, they were forced to leave. And so in March of 1550, she uh, stepped on a plane <laughs> I can't believe I just said that. She stepped on a boat, I think, and she traveled to Spain with a group of people. And I want to talk about this group that accompanied her for a minute. Um, I'm sure they would have been really glad if they were getting on a plane because, gosh, you know, instead of several months of journey, it would have been just a few hours and all the other stuff that goes along with that. But at any rate, um, the group that traveled to Spain included... Uh, the 17-year-old Francisca, her half-brother, her stepfather, uh, Francisco de Ampuero, probably like, where did he come from? Well, her mother's been married to another Spaniard, and they have a daughter together. And that daughter is also on the ship. Again, being removed, another daughter, right, of Quispe Sisa being removed, and this time being sent to Spain. And Francisco de Ampuero makes a specific argument. He says to the Audiencia of Lima that he needs to take her on this trip with him because he is worried that she will have poor care while he is absent. Very similar overtones to Medina's claim, right? Um, and it's possible that he did not trust Quispe Sisa to raise the daughter for a variety of reasons. Um, cultural, religious, political, he doesn't name any of them. It's just enough to sort of put it out there that I'm concerned she's not going to have proper care while I'm taking this trip to Spain. And so yet another girl is removed from her mother. Um, to return to Francisca for a minute, she, um, she arrives to Spain. And there she, uh, well, that's a really interesting story, as I'm sure some of you know. But she will have two marriages, several children. She never returns to Peru and never sees her mother again before her, uh, before her death. Next, I want, I want to talk about someone who um, you know, has a, a bit of a different uh, trajectory, but there are some important parallels. And that is um, the famous author, Inca Garcilaso de la Vega. He's born near Cusco in 1539. And he will also move to Spain, specifically Andalusia, in 1560. Doesn't ever go back to Peru again, yet, as we know, writes about it quite a lot. His early life blended a uh, Spanish and elite indigenous family, much like Francisca Pizarro's did. His indigenous family was from a different branch from hers, so they didn't necessarily get along or have the same ideas about Inca history and, and post-contact uh, history. His parents, as you can see here, were um, from my, my diagram, um, Sebastián Gachilazo de la Vega, who was a, a captain, and his mother was Chimpuokia. And they uh, lived together for some time in Cusco, 
They were not married, but they lived together um, as, as husband and wife, essentially, and Garcilaso lived in the house. However, in 1552, um, Sebastián Garcilaso de la Vega finally married. He married a Spanish woman named Luisa Martel, and that meant that Chimpuokio had to leave the house and that she was no longer living with Garcilaso de la Vega. This is the home where they grew up. Um, but the childhood in Cusco gives a, a glimpse into a mixed household, and I want to quote from Garcilaso just a little bit to talk about some of the things that come up. Garcilaso recalls in 1547 that they had the Bishop of Cusco for dinner in their house, and his mother fed them. I think his mother may have ordered servants to feed them, but at any rate, we can, we can picture a scene where parents and their son are in this household and participating in these events together. So there exists a familiarity with both indigenous relatives and history, um, as well as introduction to local Spaniards. Garcilaso's writing also recalls intimate details about indigenous life and customs. He describes how indigenous women in the Andes treated their hair with herbs and boiling water in order to maintain a pure black color. He claims that he was, quote, too young to notice how many or what herbs went into the mixture, but he, quote, did not, however, fail to wonder at the ordeal, which seemed to me a severe one for those who submitted to it, end quote. So classic um, women doing something that seemed awful to other people in order to look a certain way. Um, don't know if he saw his mother doing this, if he saw indigenous servants doing this, but there are these ways in which we can get sort of a political read on these colonial politics in, in early Cusco, but also get a read on these more intimate customs that are going on in the household in which he lives. Um, so I, I just to, to sort of sum up in terms of thinking about him, I think from him we can get something that we don't see in the documents we have about Francisca Pisado, and that is we can sort of see this scene that we have this house in Cusco where Sebastián Garcilaso de la Vega is with Chimpuokio and Garcilaso and other children and their indigenous and Spanish connections and relatives going in and out. And so um, this boy had a colonial family that straddled two cultures, two traditions, and ultimately two continents. Both Garcilaso and Francisca moved ultimately from their indigenous households to Spanish-run households within Peru, and then from Peru to Spain. Both were hijos naturales, a legal category which implied birth to an unmarried man and woman. Garcilaso never received a legal recognition from his father, Francisca Díaz did, but for children born to elite indigenous women and Spanish men, the institutional impulse from the crown and from the church and, um, and, and from society, frankly, at that point, was to raise the child as Christian. And as I mentioned before, few indigenous mothers in the 1530s and the 1540s had been baptized, so many men turned to Spanish relatives to raise this first generation of mestizos. And these examples of the really rich and famous of the 16th century Peru, we see both the mixed cultural influences of the childhood years and the precedent for having Spanish households uh, be the place where mestizos are raised, which is precisely what Antonio de Medina um, was attempting to do in the 1570s. So I want to move to talking now about the removal of um, children who don't come from quite the same background as Francisca Pizarro or Elinka Garcilaso de la Vega. Um, if Medina is following what seems to be a standardized standardized practice in the 1570s when he takes his daughter, the whys and hows of this practice are worth, worth our attention. The law obliged Spaniards to uphold paternal responsibilities, and this was for children born within marriage and outside of marriage, and to women of various races and cultures. Through patria potestad, fathers enjoyed the supreme legal power over their nuclear family, um, children constituted the property of their fathers, and we can see in these cases that Spanish fathers continually trump maternal ties in terms of legally defining a family. But there are some cases where there is, there is, there is language and practice that suggests an attempt on the part of the father to carry out something that he views as an obligation. So rather than seeing it as a simple cut and dry about an issue of um, negating a culture, I think it's a little bit more complex in terms of what some of these men are, are actually doing, or what they think they're doing, I should 
put it that way. As settled populations grew in Lima and Arequipa by the 1540s, a very common practice emerged by which some Spanish fathers took their children. And what they did was, rather than going up to a house and saying, all right, I've decided it's time I'm going to raise my child, um, they notarized legal powers using a third party to take children from their indigenous mother's care. And with these legal powers in hand, Spaniards claimed their children born to indigenous women from Mexico to Central America to the Andes. So I have a couple of very basic maps, but it just gives you an idea of the distance that we're talking about here. Um, Juan Gallegos of Cusco wanted his 15-year-old son Juan, who was born to the indigenous Luis of Nicaragua, and he sent uh, a man to find him, sent him with a legal power to find him. So basically, we're talking about going from Nicaragua all the way down to, um, to Cusco. And then in the second example, uh, is the, is a, this is a contemporary, uh, a merchant named Alonso Lobo, who asked a fellow merchant to find his son Juan. And Juan was a six-year-old boy. He was the son of the indigenous Francisca of Mexico City. And he sent his proxy off with a legal power in order to take her away. So perhaps he anticipated a struggle with Francisca. Um, it's certainly possible that if these children were working in the employ of someone else, that there could also be a battle about who had power over their labor, right? So who um, was able to control that. The rationale for these kinds of actions is complex. There's certainly evidence that for some men who did not have other children, they wanted to make sure that they could establish that they had an heir. Um, but there also is, um, is a precedent in terms of raising them in a Spanish household so that there is a measure of cultural legitimacy for mixed race children that can increase their social status. The existence of notarized documents to authorize taking a child from a mother suggests also that these actions were not uncontested. Indigenous mothers' voices are typically absent from the documents, but the acts preceding official legal action in front of a notary and a scribe likely involved some kind of discussion or tension between an indigenous family, an indigenous mother, or another, um, another Spanish male, an employer, and that Spanish father. The removal could also have been indicative of some kind of debate about um, patern paternity. <clears throat> Fathers claimed children in order to um, benefit from the ch children's labor, to access political power from indigenous family. And at other times, they appear to be setting up arrangements where they actually want to have the child with them. Those are not the majority of the cases I find, but there is definitely a range. So sometimes they are getting them and incorporating them into their own household. Spanish father Mateo Venenciano echoed the words of many fathers when he said that it was only a Spaniard who could raise, quote, raise, indoctrinate, and impress good habits upon mestizo children. And in Lima in February of 1552, he enacted a plan for his young son Alejandro. Alejandro was only a baby, 14 or 15 months old, and he was living with his mother in the town of Huarochiri. So um, in the case of Mateo Venenciano, he says, you know, he's, he's too young to be separated immediately from his mother, but I don't want him in the household of that priest. So he moves them to another Spanish household and orders that the indigenous mother remain in that household with Alejandro until he's old enough for her to be able to, essentially for them to be able to be separated. I mean, certainly the idea of moving a child from another's care, mother's care to another household is not something that is completely out of the ordinary during this time period. If we look at notary records in Spain, we see that children are being apprenticed at young ages. We know that um, in the Inca Empire, children were also moved around um, from their home communities. But the big thing that pops out in a case like this is it wasn't happening at 14 or 15 months old. It was happening at 6, at 7, at 8, at 9, at 10. So um, that age is something that, um, that is of interest, right? Establishing that control as, as early as possible. And so arrangements for infants and for toddlers typically kept mothers in the picture. In 1560, Gonzalo Gutierrez ordered Isabel, the mother of his natural son Juan, to, to take care, to look after my son. And she was given sustenance for a year, um, so essentially sheltered in someone's household with food, and also a lump sum of 20 pesos um, 
in order that she care for her son, which, right, I mean, so it was this complex part wet nursing contract, but also part acknowledgement of where they needed to be, that they needed to be in the home of a particular Spaniard, Pedro de Lupiana, couldn't just be any Spaniard. Um, and so Gonzalo Gutierrez was very specific about setting this up for his son. Across the 16th century then, some fathers waited for mestizo out of wedlock children to survive infancy and be weaned and then take them from their mothers with the primary goal of offering them an appropriate upbringing according to Iberian values. Thus did children such as Mencia de Ayala live in Lima, this was a young girl. She lived in Lima with a Spanish couple even though her father, her Spanish father and her indigenous mother were both um, alive and well. While some fathers, as I suggested earlier, acted out of moral, religious, or spiritual obligation, others claimed more sentimental motives. All emphasized acculturation on Spanish terms and within Spanish households. These men wanted their children to speak Spanish, they wanted them to eat, they wanted them to eat wheat bread, and they wanted them to eat it at a table. They didn't want them to eat maize while they were on a floor. They assumed their children would dress in Spanish clothes, not indigenous attire. And further, these men viewed a Spanish home as the only place to ensure that their children would be raised as Catholics, a father's crucial religious duty, um, certainly according to the church, but also according to the times. Given the interrelatedness of race and religion and the Iberian concept of blood cleanliness, this was a fulfillment, right? So raising them as, as Catholics, as Christians, was a fulfillment of a paternal obligation that simultaneously in the father's view, helped these children ensure a better status in colonial society um, and certainly in the eyes of God. In, in a very few instances, however, um, fathers did something a little bit different. They asked that their new world child be incorporated into their old world legitimate family. Hernando del Salto made a will in Lima in 1558 and he asked his legitimate daughter, Maria del Salto to care for his out of wedlock eight-year-old daughter, Ines Sica del Salto. And this was, an, this was interesting because um, he included the indigenous mother's last name in the Sica del Salto and that's not always there. So he's using that both, it's an identifier that distinguishes from the legitimate daughter in terms of, of the name. He also had a son, a mestizo son, in the New World, Juan de Salto, and asked that Maria and her husband, Antonio de Rodriguez, take him into their household as well. He asked the couple, he was pretty explicit, um, he, so he didn't just say, you know, I want you to, to take care of them and sort of leave open what that might mean. He specified that he wanted the couple to teach the boy to write, to read, and to count, and for the girl, Inés, he left a substantial dowry of um, cows and I know that sounds funny. <laughs> he left cows. Um, the, in, in Arequipa especially, anything related to agriculture was a great dowry. You were, um, you were in pretty good with agricultural things like cows. So, Salto made no mention of, of either child's mother in his will, and he shifted the responsibility for these two, two children to their half-sister. For Salto, implica his implications about um, Obligation and kinship were clearly extending right across this divide of legitimate, um, illegitimate family. Were his plan enacted, the blended family he wished for was something that was occurring informally in many Andean cities at this time already. Um, and that gets to the third part of the talk. And as I transition here to this talk about adaptation and survival, I want to make an important point about these cases about removal. Fathers of mestizo children who remove them from their mothers, appear, they appear very loud in the notary record. I mean, once I started looking for them, I couldn't believe how many of them I found. And they're quite vocal about why it's so important that indigenous families not raise these children. And this is often read as proof of how significant and how quick Hispanicization, right, a one-way practice of acculturation was occurring. Right? These men are insisting on this, and so it must be that this is what happened. However, in 1545, or 1550, or even 1570, I argue that these loud denunciations are important evidence of the degree to which Spanish fathers experienced an extraordinary presence of indigenous culture, material, social, and linguistic, 
and tried very hard to push against it. Right? So I want to make sure that we're not only reading this one way, but thinking about the other things that it tells us about their um, experiences, particularly their urban experiences. All right, so moving on to um, the third section. The documents in the archives showing the, the removal of these children um, I think are speaking about what was probably a minority experience in a couple of ways. I think it's a minority experience because, as I said, you know, these men sound a lot louder than they actually may have been in the overall experience of society. Um, but the other thing is that we know there were many children who were not recognized by Spanish fathers or were not um, given dowries or inheritances and were not incorporated into households. So that's important to point out as well. A priest who wrote in, um, in 16th century Peru, Father Juan de Vivero, said, quote, as the land is such that men give themselves to the vice of sensuality, a great many mestizos are born, many of whom turn out badly among mulatos and Indians, end quote. And this sweeping pronouncement, which we could spend almost an entire paper deconstructing on its own, um, one of the things that is shocking after you know, studying, trying to study family is the extent to which he renders invisible the mothers, the indigenous women who give birth to these children as he offers this gross generalization about the life of these mestizos, what he means by they turn out badly. Um, his words are absolutely representative of his time. The decade of the 1560s has been viewed as a watershed moment for mestizos. There were Jesuit debates to remove mestizos from the priesthood. Viceroy Toledo in Peru was, was putting into effect a series of mandates that regulated mestizo behavior um, and, well, frankly, discriminated against mestizos is the way uh, it should be put. Um, and so this is, when, when uh, Juan de Vivero is writing those words, he's really, um, he's, he's part of a larger debate that's going on at that moment about the role of mestizos in society. But looking at it from the perspective of families, right, where people are related by blood, they may inhabit the same household, they have created relationships that are separate from some of these institutional mandates, it complicates the negative assumptions about mestizos in colonial society. Inés Sique del Salto, for one, proves Vivero wrong. She did not end up among mulatos and Indians. But perhaps more important is that a lot of mestizos did end up among indigenous peoples and that those families could also have important connections to Spaniards. There were many blended families living, working, and socializing in places like Lima, Arequipa, um, Potosí, which was the subject of my first book. Um, to be sure, some fathers acknowledged their mestizo children and, and didn't remove them from day-to-day -day care of their indigenous mothers. So in the case of uh, a young mestiza named Costanza, she lived with her mother Barbola in the city of, of Arequipa. Her Spanish father contributed to their life but didn't remove her from the mother. Those, are, those cases are a lot harder to find in the record. Um, and I don't think it's necessarily because it happened less. I think that for um, financial reasons and, and reasons of uh, how much property holdings people have. I'm not able to see them quite as often. Uh, so we know for the case of the Andes that the majority of the population is indigenous in the 16th century, especially in the highlands and in most cities. Um, Lima is, is an exception toward the end of the 16th century when there's a much more um, significant African population. But the reason that I'm, that I'm highlighting this point is, is I really want to end by trying to get people to think about urban indigenous families that have mestizo or Spanish um, components. So I'm kind of trying to flip the model of how we think about family. And there's often been, with the study of mestizos, an idea about looking at when they are accepted by a Spanish family or not. Like, that's sort of the tipping point, is could they pass or could they change enough that they would be somehow accepted by um, Spanish men or a Spanish family. And so I'm trying to think about this a little bit differently, to think about, um, I trace property through wills and dowries of mestizos and indigenous women to see where their connections are to Spanish men and to see when those operate as families and even when they don't operate as what we think of, right, as this family unit, when are their ongoing ties through questions of obligation and through property transmission that extend over time. So I'm not so interested in who can move up. 
but I'm interested in how people are operating. Um, and essentially what I, what I think about is like a series of flows, almost like a flow chart, and that they're individuals who are flowing in and out of relationships and in and out of households. I mean, and, and let's be honest, if we look at family at almost any point in history, we can trace that, right? So it's very hard to find this like precise static where we don't have people moving in and out. So that's that kind of flow. And then there's a flow of generation to generation. How is property moving um, from one generation to the next? Um, and so I'm going to talk about a case from Arequipa. So an indigenous woman named Leonor was married to um, a man named Francisco Vuelta. And she brought a dowry to that marriage that consisted of a garden um, uh, a garden plot situated by the Rio Chiri near Arequipa. So this is a contemporary picture, but you know the farmland looks pretty good today. I think it was back then too. Um, so this was the dowry. Suspiciously, her dowry bordered a plot of land owned by Pedro Pizarro, not a conquistador, but another guy named Pedro Pizarro, and um, she'd had a son with him. So this was before she married had the son, Baltasar. Later on, um, she would marry Francisco Vuelta. Um, and the two of them did not have any children together. But I think that um, this land that comes from, from Pedro Pizarro is some kind of dowry for her to marry. It's some kind of representation of their shared uh, parentage of Baltasar. Just think about this picture here, you know. <laughs> That's what Leonor was looking at when she worked her field. Um, Chichani in the background with snow on it. OK, I'm going to try to go ahead over this. Um, so I want to um, just say a little bit more about Leonor um, because she, she left a will, and it's a really great source. And uh, one of the things that I'm um, interested with, with in, in terms of her, um, you know, she has this relationship with Pedro Pizarro. Um, they have a son, Baltasar. Then she marries Francisco Vuelta, who uh, happened to be another. He called himself a Spaniard. Um, but she was very clearly uh, living in Arequipa as an urban indigenous woman. So this is an 18th century representation of very elite indigenous dress. Hers was probably a little bit different, but in her will, she had numerous components of indigenous female dress. She had six yikyas, and that is the tunic um, that, uh, that women wore. She had five oxus, and that's the shawl that goes over top. Um, she had numerous chumbes. She had regular chumbes and mama chumbes, which are the large one. And the chumbes are the belt that you can see, the pattern belts right in here. Um, and one of her chumbes was specified as being a chumbe huanca, which was a specific representation to her native ethnic identity, um, the region of Huancas here. So again, she, she trekked a lot in her, uh, her lifetime as well. Um, and she also had numerous topos, and the topos are the, the pins that are used to, um, to tie the shawl together. And she had those in silver and gold. Um, so she had a lot of material possessions for an indigenous woman um, at this time period. And she ordered her executors to sell her goods at auction. However, she specified that several items be withheld for Baltasar, her son, including the chumbeguanca, the belt that identified her home region, one of the yikias, um, and I, I didn't actually double check this, but she had some that were made from very fine vicuña wool and sort of top of the line. So I'm guessing that was the one she wanted to put aside for him. Um, and she also left him uh, topos, the dress pins. And these were objects that Leonor kept through her relationship to Pedro Pizarro. Her move from, I, I mean, I, I think she's born in Wonka, but it's also totally possible that she was born in Cusco and that her identity is Wonka. But she at least keeps these, through these relationships, her move to Cusco from, excuse me, to Arequipa from Cusco. And these were practical items. She dressed in them. She used them, um, right? But they were very purposeful because they held significance as identifiers of her culture and her kin. And in her will, she made preparations for a burial in the main Catholic cathedral in the city of Arequipa. But she's put aside these indigenous objects for her son to preserve indigenous heritage in his memory. <laughs> 
Around the same time that Leonor was remembering her mestizo son Baltasar in her will, a young man was naming his indigenous mother as his heir. Alonso de Escobar, so you can see here, was born to Beatriz, who was uh, native Cañare, and Juan de Escobar was the father. And um, his, he was pretty well situated. He was, um, he was busy in a trade route that took him between Cusco and Arequipa. And I think he probably had some help from his mother in terms of establishing some of this, but he also had goods from his father, property, um, and other goods that seemed to have helped situate him. So um, he was fairly well off in terms of his economic status. In his will, he left his belongings to two indigenous women. So one's his mother, she gets almost everything. But then there's a woman who was probably his domestic partner, his lover, um, and this was a woman who was named Beatrice, same as his mother, but she lived in this place, Asangaro. So you can see, right, Cusco's here, here's Asangaro, here's Arequipa. These are his two places where he's doing all of his trading, and this is where the other Beatrice lives who gets goods in his will. Um, and actually, he left her land, so I mean, she was clearly significant to him. Um, and the one of the things that's interesting about what his mother receives, to go back to this for a minute, is the mother ends up receiving all the stuff that the Spaniard left to him. So we have this circular right, um, situation whereby the goods of the Spanish father were channeled to the indigenous mother through the mestizo son. So I think Alonso's biological family unit reflects how short-term partnerships between Spanish men and indigenous women had long-term social and economic implications. And so these examples I've just given you are men. So you might be thinking, all right, well, how does this work for women? Um, and I, I have some examples. So I'll go through one of those just before I sum up. Um, I don't have a neat diagram for it. The institution of dowry is a really great place to look for what's going on in terms of women. And this is a well-established practice in um, Spain and indigenous peoples start using written records to codify dowries as well in the, by the middle of the 16th century. Um, dowries given to indigenous couples, though they are, uh, though they are pretty scarce, um, indicated how they negotiated and sponsored marriage arrangements in this period. And um, Frank Solomon wrote a great article, probably in like 1980, about this Willie found where this indigenous woman was using it to try to arrange a marriage. And you know, I think what Frank Solomon found was, in some ways, um, I mean, it was exceptional, but also kind of a tip of an iceberg to give us an idea of how this was happening elsewhere. And so, I just want to give one example of this from Arequipa. A woman named Francisca Daki, who was who was a Chachapoya, so she was from this region um, up in the north, like north of um, Trujillo in Peru. She ended up living in Arequipa, and she, um, when she wrote her will, she provided a dowry with it, but she was very explicit about it. Um, she gave this woman Isabel Guilla, who was not her daughter, but she had raised her in her household. She gave her a huge plot of land, and she said. Um, I really want you to marry my nephew, Bautista Chachapoya, who lives in Cusco, and then you can have this land. And then a few lines later, she said, well, if he doesn't want to come and marry you, I understand, and it's okay, you can still have the land. But um, he, he did come from um, Cusco to Arequipa, right? So, um, right? so Bautista is excited about the land or about Isabel. But anyway, ends up coming to Arequipa. The two of them are married and enjoy this land. Um, and so she is very effective at you know, linking her property bequest to help out um, an urban connection that she's made, but also continue kin ties that are related to her region of Chachapoyas. Um, I want to make sure that we have time for Q&A. So I'm not going to give examples. You guys can ask me about them. But I will tell you. It is also very common for Spanish men and Spanish women to give dowries to indigenous women who've worked in their households during this period. And this is not, um, like Francisca Daki, she was pretty straightforward. Like, I really want you to marry this guy, and here's the dowry. In many of the documents that I see, um, Spanish men and Spanish women give an amount, but they're not trying to match make per se. Occasionally they will, but by and large, it is more a sense of, um, money owed for 
years of sweat equity that have already been put in that is essentially presented in the form of a dowry. Um, and so that's something that was quite common both in Lima and Arequipa during this period. Um, in some cases, though, indigenous and mestizo women struggled to gain control of funds that they viewed as rightfully theirs. Like, I've worked for you for all this time. You should give me a dowry to help me get married. Um, and in one case of this, a woman named Catalina Walco had been married for a long time. She tried to claim a 300 peso dowry from her former employer, Pedro de Villafuente. Waco wanted the money to dower her own daughter, Juana Gonzalez, so you can tell that some time has passed. Um, but the notarized promissory note that Catalina Guaco presented, along with her husband, Juan Quispe, suggests that earlier, Pedro Villafuentes had, in fact, stood in front of the couple and a notary and promised 300 pesos to Catalina Guaco when she married. This struggle is a really important reminder that these transactions were not always a done deal, right, and that there could be problems in terms of recouping the money later. Catalina Guaco's insistence that the Spaniard Villa Fuente pay the dowry could bring us back to eight-year-old Maria de Medina, and in fact it has to since I'm going to finish up. Did her father make good on his word for the 1,000 peso dowry in the 1580s when she came of age? I don't know the answer to that. Um, so on her case, the archival record is silent. And for many children like her, the, archive, um, the archival record that we have, well, first of all, it's really hard for me. If I find one person twice in these documents, I get so excited. And you know, you have to keep me down. Um, so that's a, a challenge. But the other thing that is a challenge is that the archival record really coats the kinds of emotional and tender ties that are sometimes buried in these layers of bureaucratic language. What does remain, though, is a set of documents that yield scene upon scene sometimes in households, sometimes in, vo in voyages, sometimes in um, apparently even on planes, where people negotiated the rules of family. Even those rules that might seem black and white, such as laws, were written in gray ink that could render the definition malleable over time. Colonialism in Peru meant that as families moved from generation to generation, with births and deaths, marriages and separations, Spanish men were frequently present in indigenous family networks. They were new arrivals willing to embrace a marriage alliance for political gain. They were absentee fathers who worked to take children from indigenous mothers. They were matrimonial godfathers as bosses or former sexual partners who gave dowries to young indigenous couples at marriage. And sometimes they were husbands and fathers in legal terms and in lived experiences. The discourse of their role as father is one that exists largely in terms of rescue of mestizo children from the fate of being raised with their indigenous relatives. This goes hand in hand with the image of separation between indigenous mothers and their children. These discourses and the related historical experiences are important for us to recognize and to understand. But colonial family in the 16th century encompassed a much wider range of experiences. Material evidence suggests that along with removal and separation, an equally significant process of adaptation and change was occurring. The examples I cite in the final portion of the paper ask us to question assumptions about indigenous women marrying up, about the pace in terms of acculturation within families, and about how indigenous families adapted to mestizo children. Moreover, the chronological focus, the 1530s through the 1570s, invites us to rethink the 16th century, not as the opening chapter to a colonial history of family, but as a distinct historical period wherein rescue, removal, and separation were pieces of a wider sea change. In short, the complex lives of family and kin woven in conquest-era Peru challenged the very caste and class structures of the 16th century world instead of only being units shaped by those institutional forces. The experiences of Isabel Yanawar, Antonio Medina, Elinka Garcilaso de la Vega, Hernando del Salto, or Leonor Huanca, point to a process of mestizaje, well beyond biological, that happens for the 16th century colonial family itself. Thank you.
Mm -hmm. um, but, it, but it is interesting to see what, what women would be leaving for the next generation that they would choose and become this object. So they're showing definitely um, ideas of, of wealth and what wealth translates through generations. Um, is that how much you get of an indigenous perspective of the family? So I think what about language? So you mm -hmm. take the term wakta, uh, which yeah. is Yeah. A poor person's watcha. Watcha also means orphan. Yeah. And so the idea is if you're poor, you are without family and kin. And so that tells you something right. about indigenous conceptions of family uh, as, as, as important economic units. Right. right? Um, so I wonder if there are other catch-all words that would yeah. help you. Today. Yeah, and this is a really great question. So I was going to say... Um, Oh, well, first to the issue of the um, pre-conquest practices in terms of dowry. So, I mean, there isn't something that exists in exactly the same form as the Iberian dowry. Um, and I think a lot, of, um, a lot of transmission happens later, um, right? So in terms of an idea that a mother is going to give something to her daughter, um, a father will give something to his son. So pa using gender lines to pass it down, but not necessarily doing it at the moment of marriage. Um, right, that it would come later. And so that, that's a little bit distinct and I think important to keep in mind. Um, but the, um, the, the few indigenous dowries, so say an indigenous mother and father who have, I think I have three of them, um, who have a, a dowry for their daughter. Um, those are not the only dowries I have for indigenous peoples, but a lot of times they're offered by others. Um, there is definitely more of an emphasis on material objects than on pesos um, in, the 15, in the 1550s to 1570 period, which is the, the span of those three. So I think that that is something important in terms of what people are thinking about is appropriate to give it a moment of marriage. Um, and for the Spanish, definitely there are material goods to be sure, but there is, if people have it, there's going to be a lump of silver in there. Um, and so, so that's something that I think is, is um, important. The language is a really great question. And the, the way in which I've thought about this before has more to do with family structure. In other words, terms that mean, um, terms that don't exist in Spanish in the same way to talk about family members. Um, so I'd not quite the example that you gave of orphan, but thinking about people's relationships to one another, um, which is very, very different. Although sometimes they're interesting overlaps, because one of the things that I realized when I was looking at family structure for the pre-Columbian period, is I was very interested in the concept of mestizaje, um, but there's very clearly a concern about Mestizaje for the Inca about who's your blood mixing with. So, um, you know, it's like there can be purer kinds of marriages than others. And so there were concepts about Mestizaje that were operating in the Inca period as well. So, in looking at, at family structure, that's something that's been helpful. Um, but that's, it's, it's a really great point. So, thank you. Yeah. I, um, I want to ask a question, but I also want to make a comment about this because uh, what it caught my attention a lot is about this, uh, this woman. I am Colombian, mm -hmm. so I, I, I think I know a little bit about the, uh, the history of our continent and, our, and the colonialism and stuff like that. But I had a different, completely different idea of uh, how the mestizaje happened, you know? Like, it sounds here more like a very modern situation, like these people from different backgrounds and cultures, they meet in this place, and now they are together, and they are raising kids and having families. My idea was something totally different. It was more violent yeah. and rape and yep. all these kind of things, you know? But, but it sounds here, so, I, so it makes me think, like, where this woman yeah. came from? Like, is that like they, they, they are indigenous, like they have to be like in a very specific elite inside or elite inside the, uh, their culture or something yeah. like that to be able to marry this guy and have this kind of multicultural family yeah. and raise kids that way. Because I didn't care about that and I wanna, now yeah. I wanna go and check it out like how, how did it happen yeah. in other regions like North in Colombia or Ecuador or in these other places. So one of the things um, with this project that's been a little bit tricky is how to um, situate this inside the larger historiography that already exists. Because 
Um, there's no question about the fact that there was a lot of Mesi Sake that happened precisely because of violence. And thinking about Mesi Sake in a, in a narrow definition of Mestizo children being born because of rape and violence against indigenous women. So I do not want to in any way suggest that that doesn't happen. It does. There's no question about it. What I, the way I got to this work was by finding, um, by finding wills of women where these family structures showed up. And I was like, hmm, that, that seems odd. Or, you know, women who had children with a Spaniard and then the children went to Spain and then, you know, when it, they're writing their will, they have these incredibly full lives and they're like, okay, and these, this money goes to my daughters who are in Spain. I was like, what? You know, so, um, so those were these, these family units that I started to kind of dig behind and find that there were a lot more varieties than I had expected to see um, in urban areas. I don't do the rural areas, so I can't speak to that. But here's one of the things that I think is, is really important. Certainly class is critical about how someone's positioned anywhere. So you can have a certain kind of um, um, status that can insulate you um, in certain ways, and that is really important. But I think that the other thing is that as the, um, as the 16th century moves along, certainly after the Civil Wars end in Peru, the immigration picks up. A lot of Spaniards are coming over, always more men than women, but women, women start coming um, in, the, in the 1550s and in the 1560s too. And I think that that's kind of obscured the way we understand. So like the moment of conquest or the, the years of battles and then what comes in the couple decades that follow. And one of the big things is always, well, as soon as Spanish women showed up, then there weren't any of these families anymore. And the stuff I found in Lima and Arequipa shows that that's just not true, that there are people who are marrying who are Spaniard and indigenous, or they're living together for a long time and having children and have households. And so I think that part of that demographic argument is like, oh, yeah, of course, because as soon as the Spanish women come, then this isn't going to happen anymore. But in a certain way, there are still... I think there's still demographic imbalances, but I also think that there also is a wide range of Spanish men coming over, some of whom are, I mean, there are a lot who are not elite at all. They don't have a lot of resources. They definitely have a leg up because they're European and they're in a colonial context. But in, in the case of Potosí, there were men who were really down, out, down and out. I found this when I was writing my first book. So I think it's more about a complexity that when we bring it down to a way to tell a story of, of conquest quickly, um, it, it, it's hard to, you know, to pull that out. But, I, but, this, but it's tricky. I'm glad you asked the question because I can respond. I think a way I do in the Fuller book to say I'm not trying to suggest that this legacy of violence is not there, but that there's a more complex story about what was emerging. Thank you for a great talk. To the second question first, if I remember correctly, this guy had somebody, this guy was pretty well off. I, he had a, an agent who was responsible for his, uh, for the cows and for his other holdings, if I remember correctly, that that was the deal. So then the funds, any profits would get okay. transferred. So she's just going to get the capital, not the capital. Right. Cow. Sorry. Yeah. Um, okay. And then, so, so the, the larger question you bring up here, um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, what... Catherine Byrne's article is, is fundamental in sort of establishing the kinds of things that fathers will do for daughters um, that they may not do for sons. Because there is a hope, right, that if you can 
educate properly this mestiza daughter, then she can marry anyone, including a Spaniard of a certain rank. But with a son, you're going to have a much harder time um, of, of doing, like, the, doing said thing and having that parallel. Um, but again, I think that the issue of class is really important here. Um, and so, um, and, and classes, it's hard to use then too because it's sort of like, you know, I can't, um, it's hard to compare sort of tit for tat when I'm looking at these families and say like, oh yeah, they were, look, you know, these people had all this money and they did this with the boys. Or, so class is not an exact term. But I was surprised to find that in most cases, boys and girls, sons and daughters, are, cared, are both cared for, but they are cared for in different ways. So, so I think my work opens up what Catherine puts out there in, in a little bit of a different way to suggest that you know, part of the concern about this rebel is, is more of a state concern right. um, and not a family concern, and that fathers are interested in having sons who can help them and who can, who can help them run businesses. So I have examples of a father who goes back to Spain, sends a mestizo son over to Lima to run a trading, like be, be his merchant agent. Then there's another um, family in Arequipa where the, the two mestizo brothers team up with the, the legitimate brother of the family and they run a business together. So I think depending on where someone was situated in society, the, there was a very sort of, you know, there were practical reasons to want to use those sons in, in important ways. And so that it didn't mean that you're gonna get the same kind of treatment. Um, or, but you would each get something, is essentially what I found. Mm -hmm. This is a little off topic, but it returns to the topic of violence. I know there's a certain mm -hmm. legal corpus in early modern Spain that deals with women who get dowries through legal suits because of false promises of marriage. And the terminology mm -hmm. ranges from seduction to rape, right? So right. there's a whole continuum there, and it's wrapped up in, in legal discourse. It's a place where um, class lines are crossed, of course, because it's often wealthy males that are mm -hmm. seducing or um, abducting or raping uh, women of a lower social class. So I'm wondering if that's anything that you've, you've run into um, the historiography that exists on that for colonial Latin America, um, for the most part, I think would confirm what you're talking about in terms of class being important, and also the majority of the cases that we have for that come later, not in the time period that I'm studying. I've only seen two references to this um, for the time period that I'm looking at. Um, and part of this has to do with, I mean, there's some places where, for instance, in Arequipa, trying to look at cases of first instance, they're just gone. They don't exist for, I mean, they, I think there are a few for the last few years that I'm working on Arequipa. And even for Lima, the cases of first instance are not, instance are not that, um, there aren't that many that are extant for this period. But the only ones that I have seen are explicitly about um, uh, young Spanish women and not indigenous women. Um, if I mean, the thing that I think about um, with this is that in indigenous communities, there would have been a separate um, way for dealing with that. And so going to the indigenous, going to the Spanish courts in the 1500s would probably not have been anybody's first move. And then I think in those cases where you have a Spaniard and um, an indigenous person, um, I don't think that the courts are really um, in their, their favor. Um, the only other, the, the other way that violence comes up um, in these cases is in this incredibly paternalistic use of um, the, the courts by an interested Spaniard to attempt to sort of rescue an indigenous wife or an indigenous daughter from a father slash husband who is violent. Um, yeah, but it's once you get to the 17th century, those there's there is a rich historiography um, for that. A lot more cases, and, and it confirms what you're what you're talking about. Um, more any more questions? One more. Okay. Including in my topic at all, uh, but I'm curious uh, to know uh, if you've done any comparative studies. For example, what was the situation in New England or New France? Same, well, it's not quite the same time, I guess, we were in the New like almost a century later, but right. uh, I'm just comparing with that, because the reason I'm asking is because here, uh, you know, we, we have this idolized uh, notion of the adventure of the so-called Coral de Bois, uh, who would, who would uh, you know, just go and, uh, and discover, and he would 
and mingle with, with uh, Aboriginal women and everything was all hidori. I'm sure it was probably not like that. But there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a current, there's a trend in literature to sort of idealize this, this kind of uh, uh, interface, if you like, between uh, uh, Aboriginal people, Aboriginal uh, women and, and uh, uh, European men, mm -hmm. in this case, uh, So I'm just wondering if you have any sense of how the situation you described in South, uh, South America is comparable to, to what happened in New England and New France at the, the, well, not quite the same time, but maybe it was century later? Right. So I have to confess that I don't know about recent studies. I mean, I read Sylvia Van Kerf back, back in grad school, and I thought, wow, this is really interesting. <laughs> so, <laughs> Um, so I don't know a lot about the newer things that have been written. I think that the, um, at least for the case of the, the Andes, because the in Inca Empire, um, I'm going to sound like such an Inca imperialist, it was so big and so hierarchical and so that, um, that it was different. Um, and I think to, that there is something to be said for that, but I, I kind of want to take this up with the historiographical point that you're asking about. And, and this is where I think we sort of get into this pendulum of moving between victimization as being, you know, that's all we get is a sense of victimization to then the pendulum swinging in the other direction, you know, and does it go too far, right? So have, have we swung too far in that direction? And one of the things, I cited Steve Stern, um, who's, um, whose work is, is an excellent model for doing great ethno-historical research about the colonial period. But he wrote this book at a time when I think we, we tended to think about um, women's role in this period a bit differently. And I think that what I was trying to do was sort of take this, this point that he's sort of suggesting that somehow you know, women are gaming this, that there's something to be had if I can get together with this guy or get together with that guy in a way that I think you know, th there's, a, there's a much more complex way to approach that, which is part of what I'm trying to do. And in that, then you're you do get at the question of agency, right? So am I recovering a certain amount of agency? So I think you're kind of, I, I do feel like I tread that line between, you know, can I recognize this? Am, am I reading too far there? Or, you know, if, if I go the other way, um, it's, it's victimization. So it, it, it is really tricky. Um, but I, I think it's that pendulum swinging from one direction to the other in terms of the historiography. And I guess I have some stuff to read, so thanks. <laughs> um, well, thank you for coming. Thank you. Good talk. Yeah. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone for coming here tonight, um, and there'll be another talk at the end of the month, and I will notify everybody at that point. So, so thank you for coming out. So. Thank you all very much.